All right. Welcome to tonight's program, Family Folklore and Foodways with Millie Ron. My name is Amy Lusto, and I'm the Community Outreach Librarian here at the Belmont Public Library. Thank you all for being here tonight and to the friends of the library for helping make this event possible. I invite you all to get in touch with me with any questions or program ideas, and I'll put my email address and phone number in the chat. Please also fill out our survey at the end. I'll put a link in the chat as well, both now and at the end. And just to note that we are recording tonight's session and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for future viewing. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but feel free to put your questions in the chat as they occur to you and we'll start with those. So Millie Ron is a folklorist and ethnographer who's conducted extensive fieldwork throughout New England and beyond involving living traditions for cultural and educational organizations, government and economic development agencies, and state arts councils. She curates the folk life area at the Lowell Folk Festival and has produced other festivals and music events in the region. She teaches co courses on folklore and foodways at Boston University and music and the folk revival at LaSalle University. Millie holds degrees in American studies from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and in folklore from the Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada. Being the eldest of four girls, she's been collecting her own family folklore nearly all her life. Please help me welcome Belmont's own Millie Ron. Well, thank you, Amy, and welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna have a really fun session, I hope. And I wanted to remind you, I, you know, I'm trained as a historian as well as a folklorist. And today is the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party back in 1773. I had to look up the date to make sure I was right. <clears throat> so if any of you had family members or new people that were involved in that event or any of the events around that period, we can start there. So I am going to talk about what is family folklore and, and that it certainly includes foodways. And I will um, kind of do a trade-off between some of the more uh, larger picture items and then some examples of some of the topics. And then towards the end, we'll look at what do you do with all this information? So um, <coughs> what I will say, excuse me, it's that time of year. Um, this, many of you might be genealogists and that is great, that's great research. What I like to say to people is, okay, you've got all the names and the dates. So who were these people? Where did they live? What did they do? Um, what did they do for work? What kind of family did they have? Um, how are they related? We wanna bring them to life. So that's some of what we're gonna talk about. Okay, um, so what is family folklore? We know <clears throat> the popular culture talks about folklore usually in a pejorative way. Oh, that's just folklore. That's just an old wives tale. And I say, wait a minute, I make my living on that kind of folklore and old wives tales. And the way folklorists look at it it's discovering who we are through the stories we tell, the foods we eat, the things we call heirlooms, the creations, whether they're domestic creations like knitting or quilting or occupational trades, that's also folklore and very creative in terms of maybe metal smithing or uh, I worked with some guys who are pipe fitters and they make uh, tin creatures, uh, costumes that they wear in parades and things like that. That's a lot, of, a lot of occupational people like fishermen and boat builders are carvers and they do miniatures. You know, they, they're so used to working with their hands that they've got to keep doing something. So every family is a folk group. You have unique customs and tradition. Folklore is generally oral and passed on informally. 
or through objects. And think about, <clears throat> you know, many families, people were not literate until maybe the last hundred or few hundred years. Um, and we talk about this a lot when we get to recipes. So I'm just gonna put that aside for the moment. We're talking about the tangible stuff of folklore and the intangible, the cultural heritage and personal heritage. And folklore is kind of used interchangeably, folklore and folk life as terms, but um, they're really kind of the same. Historically, folklore was the intangible. It was the songs, the stories, the proverbs, the jokes, you know, things you can't touch. The tangible was quilting and rug hooking and <clears throat> woodworking and how you built your house, how you built your barn, things like that. So I will use folklore and folk life interchangeably. <clears throat> folklore is where heritage, culture, and history come together in us. And this is just a very quick sample. It's songs, stories, beliefs, secret places, real and imagined, seasonal celebrations, recipes. We'll get into this a little bit more as we go along. So who is family? This, uh, we all hear the term kith and kin. And we construct our families in many ways. We can be blood families. We can be a um, nuclear family. We can have honorary members. Um, we have the chosen family, the people you live with. Um, families you know, can be very complicated these days. They always were complicated. Family, best friends forever. Borders, paying guests, you know, who live in the house, eat meals with you, household help, pets, companion animals. Uh, <clears throat> those are our family. So where do we get our family folklore? From stories around the fire to social media. You know, this is um, a close up of the cave paintings. And <clears throat> since people were went from grunts to constructing some sort of communication through language. They've been telling stories. This is about the hunt, right? So this talk will give you skills to discover and contextualize your personal archeology. span Folklorists are all about context. And think about things like um, the belief that if a black cat crosses your path, it's bad luck. But in many cultures, it's good luck. So you have to have the context when somebody says, if I spill salt, I throw it over my left shoulder. Why do you do that? The belief is that <clears throat> the devil is behind you, you know, ill fortune. There are so many luck traditions in so many cultures. So you need to know the context. <clears throat> we wanna talk about how to look, how to listen, what to ask, and how to situate yourself or your family in your past and present. What do you do with this material? How do you present it? How do you pass it down? Are you thinking along the lines of creating maybe a website or a book of memories? Uh, or you simply want to have the opportunity to ask lots of good questions throughout holiday gatherings. Winter is a great time to go through old photographs and objects in your house to see where they came from, what stories do you know about them. These are just some examples of what and how you can work with this information. There are family books. This actually on the right, the Beard family record are tangential relations of mine. I grew up in Maryland and it's, it was done in the early 60s. So it was a typewritten, it was a typescript, typewritten, gone to a printer and bound. The technology has changed so much. It's 
so much easier to collect lore now. The, um, the real struggle is getting away from your screen and talking to people and you almost get too much information. People love to talk about their past and their memories. And then you're kind of overwhelmed in a wonderful way. What do you do with this stuff? Our ancestors live on and talk to us. Those people whose names are in the brackets, they, um, as I said earlier, they have had lives, they had stories to tell. What can you find? So I have this object here from my personal archeology. span um, I don't know how well you can see it. This is a picture of it on the right. <clears throat> it's basically a bunch of molten lead and metal, but it was from the Baltimore fire, the great Baltimore fire of 1904. And a family member uh, who was born in the 19th century essentially looted it from a hardware store in downtown Baltimore along the waterfront, which is the area that was burned down. And it's been in my family ever since. It went from my grandmother to my father, and now it comes to me. I brought it up from Maryland. It's lived up here for many, many years now, right in Belmont. And when you're looking at your family stories, and many families uh, have moved around, you know, come from the old country, or they come from other parts of the US. And one way to kind of some people are natural historians. You know the date. You'll say to somebody, what year did you graduate from high school? And they'll tell you like that. Others have to say, hmm, it was two years before I got married. And that was, hmm, when did I get married? Well, our first child was born. You know, they have to kind of work it out. And that's fine. You want the information. But floods and fires pandemics. I have revived stories of the 1918 pandemic in Baltimore. It's when my grandmother from Ireland had her first child at right at the end of September when the pandemic was at its worst, at least in Baltimore. And here she was about to have her first child. I don't know if it was at home or in a hospital. I suspect it was at home because that's what people did then. She had no expectation of either her or the baby surviving, and they both did. Uh, <clears throat> so those are great sources, not only of stories, but of marking historical events along the timeline of your family, and kind of hangers, if you will, where you hang the history, so that all of us are creatures of the big events of history and humanity, wars and pandemics and economic uh, good times and hard times, natural disasters, it tends to be the more negative things. But one thing you can say to people is where were you when Pearl Harbor was bombed? President Kennedy was shot, uh, the great blizzard of 78, for those of you who were in Boston in those days, 9-11, uh, and on and on and on, so that those are generational markers. And everybody, in my experience, has been able to say, oh, I was here, we were eating a meal, I was wearing this, you know, whatever. Uh, and I subtitled this, What in the Sam Hill is this molten rock from the Baltimore fire? And that's a euphemism for swearing. And that, that could be part of your family folklore. Some families are prohibit use of profanity. So you have to have other words when you bang your finger with the hammer or you drop a dozen eggs that you just brought in from the grocery store as I did the other day. So our, our folklore, we have it with us. We 
might have been collecting stories over the years and find inconsistencies or somebody has another piece of the story. It's grounding ourselves in a sense of time. Like I say, ghosts of the family still walk in our and others' memories. You're creating a sense of belonging. Where do you, where do you live, so to speak, in the great mass of humanity? How do you make the world yours, the world that was around you? Uh, where did your family come from? What kind of language did you, what language did you speak growing up? What kind of foods did you eat? Uh, did this change? All of this is about who we are and each family has a unique story. We have a lot of things in common as well. And are you tied to a place, real or not? I have, and we all do, places that I describe, places that I've lived, that I was very attached to, that I would never dream of going back to see. Houses, um, countryside, and I, I say, and I realize now it's my folkloric answer. Well, it existed in another place and time, and I only visit it in my memory. And do you have places, or you've heard of places where your family lived, or the, the immigrant boarding house that your ancestors might have lived in when they first came to the US? This is an interesting picture. Um, I got it off the web. It's clearly a Muslim family. Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a strange picture and I wish it was clearer, but um, obviously the mother just, you know, she's covered. She doesn't have, you can't see her features. So where did you come from? Who are the people you came from? all about our sense of identity. Um, and think about this. We feel so attached to who we are and our stories, whether we accept it or just say, look, I'm here. I don't really care about the past. That's okay too. Um, but many people do want to know who they are, where they came from, who they came from. So how would you feel if your life went off in a different strand. And, you know, there's plenty of novels about this. Somebody finds out that, you know, perhaps they were adopted and they're not who they think they are. That's a real psychological jolt. What happens? Um, what if your family came from a different country or a different folk group? Uh, what if you were born another gender? Uh, how would you approach these stories? What would you do? Just think about that. So many of us um, have migration stories and, you know, did your people meet the Mayflower or were they on the Mayflower or any other number of boats afterwards? Clearly more recent immigrants have come by airplanes. They've crossed geographic borders in the North American continent. Um, but for, Many of us are the products of that great wave of migration from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. And many, many families, if they don't have photos like this of the mother and her children, literally carrying their life in their luggage or their bags or whatever, the, the boy has a big bag slung over his shoulder. They didn't speak English, um, America, they didn't have money to go back. So they had to make it in America. They had to make it work. And no wonder the mother looks like, oh my goodness, what do I have to cope with now? Where did they, why did they come? Where did they come from? Many of the people who came in those huge waves of migration and are still coming, came to America to eat. There's a, um, historian named Haisha Diner who writes about this. It's a, it's a shortcut to say people left because there was one family farm and there were 10 children, 10 sons, because the sons inherited usually. 
So what were the other nine going to do? They weren't going to get the family farm. Or there was religious oppression or social oppression or the Irish famine. You just had to leave or you were going to starve to death. Or you, and this is not just in the past tense. It's happening now. We read about it. We hear about it every single day. What language did your family folklore have in its story? Um, I, as I said, I, I teach at BU and I just finished grading um, today. And it was the class on food and folklore. And some of my students are immigrants. Some are one generation away. And what struck me was they came from all different places, but they talked about their forebears speaking six languages or three languages, or they would entertain because when some of them came, they were sponsored. You had to be sponsored by an American citizen um, who could be from your kinship group or you know, maybe just from the same country or religious organization. Anyway, they one person talked about, well, there was this guy from Armenia and nobody spoke Armenian, but they spoke German or French or some other language that they could have a lingua franca, a common language. So think about that because certainly a lot of those immigrants in, you know, particularly like I'm thinking of my grandparents, they came from Germany and from Ireland in the early 20th century. Now my Irish grandmother spoke English sort of, but my grandfather spoke German and had a very hard time learning English and never really did successfully. So he worked in Baltimore in the food industry where he could speak German because Baltimore was a huge German community. Um, but many of these families, and I've heard this over and over, did not speak the old country language because they were in America now and their children were going to be Americans and they were going to speak English. Now, this is very typical immigrant lore, but um, what happens is yes, you know, the kids have a foot in both cultures, they might speak Portuguese at home, but they go to school, their friends speak English. Uh, for some cultures, the older generation does not want to learn the language, doesn't need to learn the American language. So they only speak. And then there's these generational issues. And think about if you have stories about this, where particularly in Asian cultures, not just Asian cultures, but where the elders are revered for their age and experience, and yet they are helpless going to a market without their grandchild or great grandchild who can translate and communicate for them. And that brings a lot of tensions. Um, many families have stories about this. So Think about the language, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to foodways. Where did they settle? You know, we live in New England, so I'm, I use a lot of New England examples. People came from over the water, generally Northern, Southern, Eastern Europe, um, Africa. And they didn't all stay on the coast. Many of them did, but so where did they migrate to within the states or with going to Canada or going to Mexico? Um, think about your family migration patterns and think about what kind of work people did. A lot of Lithuanians went to Lawrence to work in the mills. So whole communities came from Lithuania. Whole communities went to Plymouth to work in the rope factories and you know, Lowell was, it's the epitome of the American experience, in my opinion. Lowell was built on layer after layer and is still welcoming new groups of immigrants. 
And that is the American story. And where, where and how do you tell that within your own family? Think about family maps. Again, this is more of the migration story. Uh, this particular picture I also found on the web. And it looks to me like the Great Migration when many Black people moved up along the coast to the coastal cities that had a lot of factory work and industrial work, or if they came from the deep south, they followed the Mississippi up to Memphis and St. Louis and Chicago and Detroit. And that the music that came out of that particular migration is incredible. In Baltimore, there were so many Appalachian people who came up during the Great Depression and particularly during the war to work in the defense plants. When the Armenians were victims of genocide at the, in the early 20th century, they came to Watertown, as did Greeks. And many of those cultures didn't grow up in Greece or Armenia, they grew up in the Middle East. So, or North Africa even in Egypt and Tunisia. And so they came with so many cultural mixes to begin with. Those are the stories that they brought and that went with them when they migrated. So where is home? Uh, that's a personal question I've been asking myself all my adult life. And how do you answer that? Uh, this week's New Yorker had this gift. Um, Every family, you know, oh God, there he goes again. He's telling his war stories. He's telling the story of, you know, the family legend about the buried treasure. And if only we can really learn to read the maps, we'll find it. So here's probably grandpapa. Congratulations, you've told the same joke 1000 times, says the grandson. And this is, it's interesting. It's in this week's New Yorker. We haven't gotten to December 20th yet, but you can see that the younger kid is not very happy. So where do you start? Okay, that was the introduction. This, this picture is just lovely. It's got three generations. Grandma is going through the family album. Uh, they've, they've certainly got their a lot of their history on the wall behind them. Maybe you do too in your house. I love decorating with photographs and maps and family pieces. Start where you are today and work backwards. Um, and folklore doesn't have to be old. And in fact, it's this combination of old and new traditions have to change with the times. If you had the same Thanksgiving turkey dinner that your great grandparents had when they came to America, became citizens, and in many stories, people start celebrating Thanksgiving when they become citizens. And if you had that same meal, well, you couldn't recreate it. The stoves are different, the ingredients are different, the turkeys are gonna taste different. Um, and as I tell, I have this, lecture I give my family every year about this time. If the holiday tradition, in our case, Christmas, if it starts to feel like a burden, don't beat yourself up about it. Change the tradition. You don't have to bake 20 different kinds of cookies. You don't have to give gifts to the neighbor's dog and you know everybody else change the tradition if nobody likes turkey or for thanksgiving or for christmas serve something else i've known people serve lasagna what is the tradition about is it about the food is it about the family gathering together or is it about having hot food on the table and everybody's watching a parade or a football game or something. Um, do what works for you. Think about how, again, start where you are. How and when did you come to live where you do now? And I do this when I'm doing the festival at Lowell. I, I have people from different traditions talking about their cooking on the food waste stage. And until 
well, the last festival we did was two years ago, but they would create something, talk about their history and their heritage and serve a food either they made it in front of the audience's eyes and then people could have a taste of it or they made it that way and then had cooked something on the side that we served up that's not going to happen um, anytime soon again but I say to them all right we are standing on this foodway stage in Lowell Massachusetts on a hot steamy July day how did you get here today you know, did you and your family arrive last month? Did you arrive three or 400 years ago? Were you already here? Were you greeting the people that came, mostly Europeans? Um, tell me your story. So how did your family get here? And who can you ask for stories? You know, if only we had paid attention when we were kids, right? You know, we would love to hear those jokes again and those stories. We heard them so many times, our eyes, eyes would cross and glaze over. I hear one more story about blah, blah, blah. Now we, we have to dig for those stories. They might be in photos, they might be in recipes, they might be in objects, they might be in, diaries or journals or professional papers or business papers. Um, we've all got good research skills, right? I mean, we wouldn't be doing a program situated at the library if we didn't. So um, again, language is crucial. Language is culture. So I bring that up. So find those documents and dig them out. Good sources are family Bibles, diaries and journals. Um, were you a people who wrote letters? I mean, there are letters, you know, during wars or in many cases, a member of the family came first and found the job and housing and then sent the money to bring the rest of the family. But in many cases, again, we're talking about late 19th, early 20th century, primarily, and a lot of people were illiterate. So you're very lucky if you have letters and stamps and postmarks, which can kind of trace your, your migration paths. Immigration and naturalization papers have some information if you have them. Again, official documents, um, college diplomas, professional degrees, uh, licensing for businesses or shops. Here's a really important point that folklorists make all the time. Don't worry about the truth, because of course, what is the truth? Who's got the truth? Think about why someone tells you that they are descended from royalty in the old country. If only we had stayed, we had this big castle in the mountains and money and all of this, and then we came to America and we lost it all. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. One thing as a folklorist, I really believe that some of these tales that are told so much the same way from time to time do have a kernel of truth in them if you keep working at them. And some of them, of course, are not. You know, every family seems to have a black sheep. And look at this photo. I was saying to Amy before that, again, I wish it was clearer, but everybody's got these professional photos that were taken at Sears or um, those stores in the 70s in particular. You know, so here's the kid with a quasi mohawk, but then you see the mother and she's holding the cat. She's totally detached from her kids. So he probably got his black sheep tendencies, honestly. But so many families have a black sheep. Um, they talk about fortunes gained and lost. We used to be somebody. We used to have things and property and, and all of this. So in my family, my Irish grandmother came in 1912. And I know this because I actually lived in Ireland at one point and have talked to the family all the time, but we can't find the documents and they have 
one version of the story. She came in 1912, but nobody expected, she had tickets on the Titanic, right? 1912, the Titanic, but nobody expected it to sink. So she might indeed have had tickets on the Titanic, but that doesn't mean she was going to sail in April. She might have been sailing at the end of the year, who knows? And until I do more research, um, this may or may not be true, but then little things that have come up um, kind of support that story. And I won't go into it now because I'm sure you have stories like that, but keep working at them. I mean, you know, the more life experience you have, the more people you talk to, the more research you do. And of course, it's so much easier now because we have Ancestry, we have the web, we have uh, Wikipedia. It's great. So in terms of don't search for the truth, why is somebody telling, why is somebody telling you this? Remember, as they say in Maine, just because the cat has her kittens in the oven, it don't make them biscuits. And proverbs and sayings like this are also part of your family folklore. My grandmother, my Irish grandmother, who I spent a lot of time with, you know, she said, Rome wasn't built in a day, or I've made my bed and now I have to lie in it. I mean, you, you've all got these sayings and some of them might be in the old language, old country language, but you've heard it enough, you know exactly what it means, if only from the way it's said. Think about genres, um, naming traditions. Some families have very strong naming traditions. The firstborn son is named after the father or the grandfather, uh, the same with the daughter, or the parents pick a letter and all the children, you know, maybe both parents' names start with the same letter and so their children are all Jane, Jean, John, so has your surname changed? Was it one of those immigration stories that we've all heard? Our people got to Ellis Island and they couldn't spell a name that had, you know, it was this long. Um, so they changed it to Smith or something. That might be a little extreme, but many people change their names to make it easier to spell or shorten it or to fit in, anglicize the name. Uh, how do you combine marriage names? Not simply hyphenation, but different cultures, women don't change their name when they're married or they put them in a different order or maybe the, the partner, the spouse changes their name or they pick a completely different name to start their family. Children's names, given names, nicknames, pets names, those are not uncommon, but many people name their houses. Um, I grew up in two houses that had names. One, because it was a very old farm and it, it didn't even have a street address until about the very, very late 20th century in the maybe the late 80s, 90s. Um, car names, my father always, he always had Chevys too, like in this picture. He, he always talked about his fliver, which is kind of the generic car, but then each of his cars has a name. Each of my cars has had a name and has a name. Boats, boats always have women's names. Um, even place names, pay attention to place names. That might be part of, particularly if you, if you lived in a city, you would have a neighborhood name that may or may not still be around. If you lived in the country, there might be a road, the, um, the poor house road, which is all over Maine, because that's where the poor house was. And there's a whole genre of stories about poor houses that I won't go into because they're pretty weak. But um, in New England, what I love is we also name things for what used to be there. Um, Harvard Square, we know Harvard Square, but what about Pilgrim's Corner? I don't even know if that exists. I'm sure it is somewhere. And everybody nods their head or, and I, 
I actually was caught out saying this to someone the other day. I was giving them directions to a place in Waltham. And I said, well, it's where this such and such building used to be, but then it burned down. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. And that's a New England thing. You know, you turn where the farm used to be and now it's a, a bank, a drive-through bank or something. So think about place names. They might be attached to families who own property or started a business in that area. Um, I'm just gonna speed up a little bit. The big three, hatched, matched, dispatched, birth, marriage, death, wetting the baby's head. That's an Irish saying. You know, yes, they go for a christening or baptism, but the celebration is usually involved with um, alcohol and, and other drinks. So it's, it's a metaphor for the celebration. Um, look at wedding photos. They're very revealing. Everybody might have a version of this, either the man sitting down, the woman's got her hand on him or vice versa. The luck rituals that go with weddings. We don't so much throw rice anymore, but we might throw bird seed or still tie an old shoe on the back of the car or decorate the car with the just married sign. Um, Wakes and funerals are definitely different than they used to be. But the whole point is that the dead have buried their dead and we want to mourn together, but it's really reconfiguring the circle because there's a missing piece, the person who just left us. So we have to get together and food and drink and socializing make those rites of passage much more bearable. Food makes everything bearable. Um, think about other rites of passages, coming of age, meeting and courtship rituals, hen and stag parties, um, jilted lovers. More and more, we're hearing about divorce celebrations. Um, people might have different kinds of funerals or do their own do-it-yourself funerals or keep urns of someone's ashes, a family member or a friend's ashes on the mantelpiece, burning the mortgage. Uh, that tends to be institutional, particularly churches or organizations that took on a debt to build a structure. But I know of individuals who have burned mortgages to their house. It's a huge rite of passage. It's paid for. Look at old photographs. When I work with the kids, I say, now, what do you notice about this photo? And they'll eventually say, well, there's no color. Bingo. Because that film was black and white for a long time. Uh, these are great opportunities where tradition and research are magnets. Use them. Um, talk to old neighbors if you can, or talk to uh, Reunions, if you go to your school reunions or neighborhood reunions. Towns used to have picnics. Some of them still do in New England and elsewhere have coming home days. Um, your history is American history. I've said this before, but if you have service records can be a good source of tales. Many people who were in the military don't want to talk about the the nitty gritty of it, but they will tell about, oh my gosh, you know, I landed in Vietnam or Iraq and they opened the door of the plane and the heat just about wore me out. I haven't even gotten out of the plane yet and I, I can't adjust. Um, more recently talking about the Vietnam War and the draft. Um, we've had wars all through our history. Um, think about the Uncle Sam gave you an opportunity to travel to where uh, some people liked where they went and when they finished their service, they stayed. Uh, think about you have medals and souvenirs. And I will send Amy several uh, references on the web in particular. The Veterans History Project is housed at the Library of Congress, um, LOC government. It's uh, a way they define veterans history as almost anybody who was touched by the military, you know, living near a military base or uh, being a family member of somebody who was serving or somebody who was a conscientious objector or a nurse or a doctor 
at a military base. Pick a place in the world. So who are these people and why are they here? Use every opportunity if you really get into this. People are coming to your house for Christmas or another celebration. Bring out the photos you haven't identified. Bring out the questions. When you take pictures now, please label them, even if it's they're digital pictures and you have a digital album, but jot down somewhere the date, the time, the place, who's in it, um, why are they there? We know, you know, we've all got probably shoe boxes full of pictures like this. We don't have somebody to ask, they're all gone. Um, we may or may never know. Okay, and then there's food and food ways. There are very various versions of this postcard. It hangs, this particular one hangs in my kitchen. You don't know beans until you come to Boston. And it's a metaphor, but as the folklorist, I always say, well, did you ask someone? Um, why, why did you find shoes? You know, we just saw this news article about um, some of Paul Revere's descendants found things in the walls of a house. That's very, very common in New England. But of course, it's one of those customs that traveled westward across the US. Um, and instead of trying to think why, well, ask someone. You know, a lot of it was luck rituals. Uh, mostly it was luck rituals. But sometimes you find things that you don't want to find in the walls. That's different. Uh, I love the two fat ladies who were on television. They're both gone now, unfortunately. And they write about, um, they write better than many academic folklorists and historians. And it's about food. It's the history that you can touch and taste. And the rituals of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, there's everyday rituals that we don't even think about. You've got to eat several times a day. Your pet has to eat several times a day. You just do it. But how do you distinguish between what you have every day and what you have for a special occasion? Or you've just had a really good day generally and you, you want to have a glass of wine or you want to make a special dinner. How do you distinguish between the everyday and the celebration? I love this picture because as a folklorist, I can almost palpably see the tradition being passed on from the grandmother to grandson. This, you know, we get out our good dinner dishes and our gravy dish for special occasions. And this is how, you know, we do it. And, and so food ways are not just recipes, but it's all the stuff and the stuff in your head that goes into what you cook and what you eat. People say you are what you eat. I, as a folklorist, say you eat who and what you are. You might totally have adopted an American diet of fast food. Um, but I would venture to say, come special occasions, particularly Thanksgiving, because it's such an American holiday, there will be something on your table. Might even be a food you don't like to eat, but it has to be there because it's one of those memory prompts that our people came from fill in the blank, and they've always had this on the table. It's beliefs, it's customs, it's the implements. Do you have the pot that your grandmother or great grandmother made chicken soup in? Um, the techniques, the community. Gathering around a table, and not every culture eats at a table, we know that, but gathering around together, gathering around a meal, is the telling and retelling of migration stories and personal stories. And they all of a sudden, over time, it's like archaeology. You know, you have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of all this family lore. And yes, it changes, but a lot of it remains the same. It's all about remembering and passing it on. Holidays are a great time. Again, you know, this is the best time of year to talk about stuff like this. Kitchens are great places. They tend to be gendered. They're private. They're intimate. It's the heart of the home. Um, and when families 
are, you know, here we have three generations. When families are making the stuffing for their, their uh, spring rolls or their noodles, and um, they're telling stories. What was it like when you came? What was it like when you were in high school? You know, the granddaughter saying to her grandmother or even her daughter, her mother, um, what did you wear? You know, when I went to school, I mean, I don't want to date myself, but we were not allowed to wear pants. You know, I was just on that cusp of the 60s and 70s when girls wore dresses. And of course, we had them rolled up practically to our you know what, but um, we still had to wear dresses. So telling stories, it doesn't have to be old stories. We all have, the kids have family folklore. Recipes, are they written or oral? We talk so much about to this day, who's got so-and-so's recipe for the chicken soup or the Christmas cake or whatever, because again, many people, even if they were literate, didn't write things down. Partly it was proprietary. I make it, no one else can have it. Or um, it was just never written down. And generations afterwards it tried to recreate the taste. Particularly if the recipe says, if it's written and it says, well, you want a pinch of this or a handful of that. You know, it was Fanny Farmer at the Boston Cooking School in the late 19th century who started doing exact measurements. Some people still do exact measurements, particularly for baking. Others are more laid back and learn by what works and what didn't work. The key is, think about this in your own family. Who is the keeper of the recipe if there is a physical recipe or maybe just a memory recipe and who gets it next? Home remedies and old wives tales, we've all got, how do you treat stomach aches? How do you treat a cold? Chicken soup, the knowledge that is embedded in chicken soup. Nobody had to say, well, it's got salt because that will dry out your sinuses. It's got fluid, it's hot, it's got meat, it's got protein, it's got vegetables. People just knew that. You didn't have to sit down and, and talk about how it all comes together chemically and otherwise. Uh, this is an image from Father John's, which was one of the many patent medicines out of Lowell and also other uh, mill towns. And in some of the French mill towns, particularly in New Hampshire and Maine, it was candies. Lowell had candies, either hard candies or chocolates. Chocolates were especially identified with French mills. Some mills people could talk, amongst themselves, some were not, so they would suck on candies, also to cut down on the fibers they were ingesting. Father John's was the patent medicine, but it didn't have any alcohol in it. You know, Lydia Pinkham had the alcohol for women and for what ails you. And of course it had enough alcohol, you didn't really care what hurt, you just... Um, Father John's was for the Irish parish that did not have any alcohol. And it's actually still made in Cody, Wyoming. I've never tasted it, but it's still all over. And the building in Lowell where it was manufactured is now artist lofts. So again, our history is in our landscape and I'm not even getting into landscape history. So what do you do with this stuff? I know I'm getting towards the end. Um, this is something that I did in 1998 and it was ancient history at this point because I used a word processor, but it was in a three ring binder. I gave it to my sisters for Christmas one year. I essentially interviewed myself and in a sense without, the, without a recording device, then it would have been a tape recorder. Um, and I, as if I was talking to somebody in the family and I talked about Many of those, you know, pets' names and places we used to go on vacations, and you know, our forebears and my mother's story. They came very early, um, in the early 1700s. My father's family were 20th century immigrants. That's the American experience in our family. They, the early folks, plopped down in their Pennsylvania Dutch. They came on what was called the Mennonite Mayflower. That's just a colloquial name. 
landed in Philly, went into Lancaster and Lebanon counties, and they're still there. They founded a lot of the townships. My father's family got off the boat, actually both of them, in, my grandmother in Baltimore, my father in New Jersey, grandfather. And then he, as I said, he went to Baltimore because it was German speaking, um, is my theory. We don't know, he died very early. But document, it's so much easier now. Everybody's got a recording app on their phone. You can use all sorts of stuff. Do not get voice activated software. I caution you, they don't work. Um, but anyway, I gave this to my sisters in a three ring binder because recollections may vary. We've heard that. Um, they're, they're younger, we're very spread out in age. And they remember things differently, or they didn't know the older generations that I did. And not only did I give them the binder that Christmas, but I gave them a packet of tissues, which I said, you have to open this first. So they knew something was coming. Look for patterns in your family folklore and photos are the easiest ways. Um, are they formal photos? Are they informal multi-generations? Um, are they clever arrangements? Um, in my father's side of the family, we're the sofa series. And we have at least three or four generations of family pictures. Everybody's on the sofa or spilling in front of the sofa, but the sofa is there. In my mother's side, they're standing outside, usually, almost always outside, either, you know, the stair steps, the shortest to the tallest, or, you know, more of a grouping of the family. Think about where you take your pictures. Do you have a pattern? Is it unconscious? Formal or informal, posed or not posed. Pictures are worth a thousand words. You can sometimes really pick out the dynamics, like this guy who's looking up saying, oh my God, I've got to spend the afternoon with my wife and my mother or my mother-in-law to go to this wedding or event. A kid's first um, haircut, that's another rite of passage. We don't stand in front of our places of business anymore. We don't even go to our places of business anymore in many cases, but there's a whole genre of photographs like this. This was women working in the defense plants during the second world war. These are workers probably, um, you know, it could have been a mill or a factory. There are lots of photographs of people at work. So my message is, Go forth and collect. This is a great time of year. You might be creating the first tangible record of your family's stories. You know, they're floating around in people's memories, but you're starting to tape those memories, transcribe them, make notes. Your family will love it because you're passing it on and they will have something. Your kids might not care about it now, I would predict when they start having their own kids, they want to know what makes this family unique. And that's when they're going to want to know. We are history. Each of us possesses a wealth of folklore, historical knowledge and experience, memories, tales. So I say, go forth and preserve your past for your future. So thank you for this part of the night. And I am very happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Millie. Wow, that was just so much to ponder and think through and brought up so many memories for me. I'm sure we could all, if we were in person, we'd just sit around and share stories with each other before we even had to interview a, a single relative. Um, so I'm going to put the link in the chat again. It's just about eight. So if people need to go, don't worry about it. But if you can stay, if you have questions, that would be great. And we do have, I want to start off the Q&A with a question from Anne. So if anybody else thinks of one, just type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself when we are done answering this one. But the first question, if uh, it, it was early on, I think in the slideshow that you have up, uh, the picture of the woman who was covered up. Um, and the question is, could it be feasible that the covered woman was an enslaved person or a servant? 
That's a good question. Um, I'd have to go back and look. I would say no. I think it was probably a Muslim family um, because I've seen pictures of Muslim families. Um, some immigrants had Muslim roots, but they switched their religions when they came to America, switched their religion when they came to America. But I have, that's a good point. Um, usually in those days, if it was an enslaved person or um, a servant, they would not have had the children grouped around them. And this is where you learn of, or conjecture about family dynamics from photographs. I would venture to say, I mean, I've seen pictures of people with their ayah, um, particularly if they were in Asia, um, perhaps a European family with the, the native um, indigenous uh, childminder. And those are much more formal pictures, even if there was a very warm relationship. Um, so that's a good question, though. I'm going to have to think about that. Yeah, I mean, you, you said you found it on the internet, but not where, so you would have a better idea of where you found it. Indicated. No, and that's where context comes in. Um, and I, I have not done a lot of field work with Muslim peoples. I've certainly um, presented Muslims on foodway stages where people have been, nobody's in the full hijab, but um, I, that's not my culture. So I kind of ask the general questions and let them decide how much information they want to give. And that's also if some people are using their family folklore to help heal trauma or just a string of bad, not just, but a string of bad luck, which is a kind of trauma. And when you get to that point, um, you have to be very, very careful that you stay focused on the family folklore. We're not trained as therapists. And I have been in some of those situations where I've had to say, you know, I think I've got enough information now. Let's, let's move on to something else or let's take a break. And that brings up, if you're talking to a family member and they might start crying or get angry, because of what they're remembering. Most people don't want to stop the interview. They want to tell you about that incident because it's clearly emotional making for them. But say, let's take a break. Let's go get something to drink. Let's um, have a cookie. Let's come back in half an hour. And generally that will be enough time that they've composed themselves. You've composed yourself. Um, don't be afraid of trauma or conflict is what I'm saying. Handle it as, you know, sometimes you have to take a lot of deep breaths or bite your tongue, but um, you want that information. It's part of your story too. Okay. Yeah, particularly tricky sometimes with family <laughs> when topics are loaded <laughs> or can be. <laughs> Um, let's see. I mostly just noted really interesting things that you said. Um, what you said about not going back to visit an old home reminded me of not my, my trepidation in rereading childhood favorite books. Like, will it, will it stand up? I was a different person when I was seven, you know, when I read this last or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's my thing. Uh, because these places do exist in the context of the time and your memories. And I, there's one house that I lived in when I was very young that I will drive past every now and then, or I'll look it up now on Google Maps. But other houses, I've heard this one house we lived in in Baltimore was actually out in the country. It was exurbia um, then, and it was surrounded by farms. We had it was almost like a secret garden, a secret orchard. And I've heard that all of that land has been sold and it's now developed and it's just, the house hasn't been well cared for. I could not cope with that. 
you know, it's, and actually my memories aren't about the house so much. It's about the orchard and the pond and making, you know, houses with trees and, and um, linens from bed linens and, you know, taking food out of the kitchen and taking it to my little nest and, you know, the dog there and all that. Um, things change. And I, I get you, Amy, I'm reluctant to read or books that I used to read. And I think I can't deal with all this testosterone anymore. You know, I used to read Jack Kerouac. He's, he's actually, he's a literary hero, but he's not a hero in his own town of Lowell. And all that guy stuff, I just can't. And, you know, so, and those are part of our family stories, you know, the patriarch or the matriarch. I mean, it's not just the guys. Um, that's when you have to bite your tongue a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure if you are looking at the chat, but somebody said it's interesting because I always want to go back and see my former residences, old favorite places, etc. I can't imagine not going back to see those places ever again. Also, I always reread favorite books. <laughs> Everybody's different, right? Mm -hmm. And for that person, they need to kind of, you know, touch base with their past and that's fine um in fact just see for a long time i didn't look i didn't go back to the neighborhood that i first lived in when i moved to boston many years ago and i was on it was in the city of boston and i was on that side of town and it was just the other night and i thought you know i haven't been up this way for ages and it was off of the Sitco sign, I have, a, it's not that great a sign. I wish they had kept the white fuel sign. But the Sitco sign, when I moved here, I was married to an archaeologist who was never home. And I would find the Sitco sign, that would put me on Com Ave. And then I could find our apartment because it was up a series of one, it was a tiny one block long street off of all these one way streets. And it still is the neighborhood and they've rerouted some of the one ways. But, um, you know, I was just in a mood where I wanted to see that. Mostly I just think, oh, I've come so far. Yes. <laughs> you know, and again, a lot of this is mood making or we, we are interested in certain things. We want to know, it might be hard to really try to imagine, but what was it like? for ancestors to come on a boat with tons of other people. It took, you know, a week or more. You couldn't just hop in the shower. You had all your worldly possessions, which weren't very many. And you might've spoken a language. You know, you were with your cultural group perhaps. And some of those cultural groups stayed together. Where did people go? Well, they went where, earlier family members had gone or people from their home village in anywhere in the world. Um, and we still do that. We move where our friends move in many cases. You know, we're, we need people and we love people. And, you know, we tell these stories. And then one day you're 20 years older and you say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Um, or oh, I never thought of it that way because we're moving through time, we're moving through our lives, but the world is changing around us simultaneously. And that's why, as I say to my students all the time, there are no right or wrong answers. It is your story and you tell it this way now, but you might tell it differently. You might embellish things or you might strip off the embellishments and say, it was really hard. I did not like, you know, eating uh, muskrats because, you know, during a period when I was really poor, these are depression stories in particular, but I've heard more recent ones, people um, who went through hard times and talking about, I will never eat canned beans again or whatever. Um, and that's a marker because we've, we've done better than that, or we're so afraid of being poor again, or, whatever um so work with what you have 
reinterpret it. You might think about it. You might dream about it. You know, it's, I mean, I really, I, I am part Irish, as I said. I do believe in ghosts and I do, I don't, well, belief is anything about beliefs, whether it's religious belief or culture belief is the hardest thing to talk about with people because they don't want to admit necessarily they believe in ghosts, but they'll tell you a ghost story or, yeah, I heard that noise last night. I wonder if that was, you know, so-and-so coming back to visit um, or they've had some sort of uh, psychic experience where, so, you know, you've heard these stories, someone dies on the other side of the world and you wake up in the morning and say, oh, they were at the foot of my bed last night. And then you find out the phone rings later, and you know, things like that. Belief, because people are so afraid of being made fun of. So you have to really be in a trusting situation and have established trust. And, you know, as a folklorist, I'm a professional outsider. And in fact, collecting folklore from my own family, except for my sisters, is like pulling teeth because they'll say, or I'll say, well, you know, my mother always said, you'll understand why this happened when you're older. And now time has gone on. And I'll say, well, what was she talking about? Oh, we don't, we don't talk about that anymore. It's like, well, if you don't tell me, it's going to go with you. And none of us are going to know about this story. You know, the skeletons in the closet. Some people love talking about the skeletons in the closet. Some families totally clam up. No, we didn't. Have, that didn't happen. Well, here's a photograph or here's a newspaper account. Funny, it mentions, you know, all these didn't happen. OK, that's their truth. Don't don't worry about the truth. Why are they telling you what they're telling you? We've all been there, right? I think that's the hardest thing. My my partner is a an anthropologist and ethnographer himself, and he is always saying that and that's the hardest thing for me because I want to I want to know the truth. Um, I think we have another question. Yes, Kanya. Um, hi, Millie. Um, hi. I'm actually I'm 100% Irish and um, first generation immigrant. And it's just that the, the items that you've spoken about resonate very much with me. And I believe that when you are an immigrant, what is your folklore and traditions are very important to you. You don't want to lose them. You want to pass them on, but you just take for granted back at home in Ireland, which is part of your existence becomes vitally important to you as an immigrant. And, you know, as you're speaking there with regards, especially around Christmas time now, we would have had, we do have, so many traditions that, um, you know, when it comes to making Christmas cake, um, it's the youngest and the oldest that would have the last turn of it before it's put into the baking um, bowl or dish, before it goes in the oven. Um, bread, you always put the sign of the cross on bread. You never take food for granted. You don't waste food. Um, and also it was interesting that you mentioned about um, folklore with regards burying our dead and the traditions that go hand in hand with that and the belief that we do have a connection with dead people. Irish people, are, it's, it amazes um, different cultures, but if you're not Irish, you're not going to understand it. We are not afraid of the dead. We, we uh, venerate our dead. We have very, very strong traditions around death and a lot of it can be misconstrued with regards what's done with traditions whereas when it comes to America a lot of the traditions are, are watered down here and they replace alcohol for stuff that I when I grew up alcohol was not part of my life it was not part of our tradition but yet here in America the American Irish a, a lot of their social lives revolve around alcohol and that had to do with they doing the best they could with what they had and it was the only uh, kind of commu communication they possibly had with people that came from their own countries so a lot of things that wouldn't necessarily be prevalent 
if you lived in Ireland or in another country or Germany or wherever country you came from, becomes very, very important when you're an immigrant. You know, it was interesting. I went to graduate school in Newfoundland, as Amy noted, and Newfoundland, it's part of Canada politically, but it's still a British colony. And there's the British side and the Irish side and the French and Portuguese and, you know, all those languages are there, but it's an island in the Atlantic. I did not understand, and I went as a mid-career change to graduate school. I didn't understand either my own Irish in Maryland or the Boston Irish, because I was married into a Boston Irish family until I went to Newfoundland. And because it is so remote, it's all the things you were saying that in some, you know, immigrant cultures, no matter where they came from, you hang on to what you know, because that is your last connection to the old country. And food is the best way to get into that. And, you know, every, every immigrant, if they just got off the plane yesterday, they will say, I, I come to America, I want to make money, I want to open a restaurant. Because food is, first off, it's an easy way to talk about some issues over food and through food. Well, why do you have that on the table? Why is it in that special dish? Do you use that dish all the time? Do you only use it for special occasions? Um, but it's the smells, the tastes, and and as I say, it's some of the residue. And think about, you know, talking about the, the dead. I mean, Americans generally, we're, we're afraid of everything. And I think part of that comes from media. You know, you might get this disease. You might, you know, there's, there's people waiting to mug you when you go outside your door. I mean, oh, give it a rest. But think about um, the Day of the Dead in Mexican and other Latino and Latina traditions, they mock death. And that's one way of coping with it. And we used, death used to be part of life. I mean, it is still part of life, right? But, um, but when, people, when people lived in more isolated conditions, you know, they were farming, animals were dying, women were dying in childbirth or the babies were dying. It was just part of the natural world. And we have so removed, we don't want to deal with anything that's negative or emotional. And that the pendulum has swung so far that way, it will find its true mark down the middle. And I think that's why so many people are interested in creating rituals and marking the turning of the year. And, you know, there are ancient so you know the solstice is coming solstice is coming up i was just going to mention it to you solstice yes. and solstice, um yes. mm -hmm. exactly and Huge, you know yeah. mm -hmm. eating eating foods in their seasons or in the winter what you put up the reason we have lent in the christian tradition is because when is easter it's in the spring you haven't planted anything yes. and if you were celebrating way too much over the winter holidays and the cupboards were bare literally tough you starved until harvest came many traditions greek traditions um the reason the mediterranean diet is so venerated you know as long as you're talking about religion is because it's not just eating the foodstuffs, but those cultures, those Mediterranean cultures have fast days and some of them are religious related, some of them are culture related, which is religious related, but there's periods of fasting so that that is good. We're hearing more and more that maybe not a full fast, but you know, don't drink or don't have dessert on the weekends or, you know, during the week or, you know, all these different ways. We have that traditional knowledge. We just haven't used it in many cases. And we, we are creatures of ritual. And that's why people have now, you know, created these divorce celebrations or um, naming traditions for children. They don't necessarily go to a church or a synagogue or, you know, but they have a, some sort of ritual to mark 
this new being in the circle or when somebody leaves the circle. And, you know, the first day of school, how many people take pictures of their kids the first day of school? That is a huge rite of passage. And, um, you know, things like this, this urge to traditionalize, it's, it's in there. And as a folklorist, of course, I just love when people say, you know, I never really cared about these stories. I wish I'd paid more attention when my parents were talking. Now, if I could just have them back for a day and I turn on the tape recorder recording device and go at it, because um, you have to work so much harder to fill in the blanks. And they could say, and of course, we never know if we've got the story right. You know, we think we, we go on ancestry or, you know, we read histories of places that we know our family lived, but it might just be you know, the barn fell down because they didn't build it properly because they were back to the landers and they didn't know anything about, you know, the traditions of barn of building barns or houses and it fell apart. They would tell you that in a second and you're thinking, oh, that's a really interesting design, you know, things. And I mean, this has all happened in my field work. Um, so I could bore you with stories for the rest of the night. But um, do you have any other questions, anybody, or instances? And as I said, I will give some um, sources to Amy, and she can, I don't know, post them. Another great source is the Smithsonian in Washington on the Mall. Uh, they have a national festival every late June, early July on that on the Mall near the Smithsonian Castle. And now it goes, well, it's it's a good part of the mall. It keeps, it's been going on since the late 60s. And for the bicentennial in 1976, the founding, you know, the Declaration of Independence flash forward 200 years, they started collecting family folklore. Anybody could walk into the tent and there were folklore students and, you know, community scholars um, collecting these stories. And they now have a website, they had a book. And now there's a website with a lot of the questions and some, you might've heard the term life histories or personal histories. And there are a number of online resources where if you've got someone, and it doesn't have to be a relative, it could be someone in your community. Um, but questions like, and like I like to ask, okay, this person is 90 years old. And when you started school, how old were you? Where were you? Describe your day from the minute you open your eyes. Were you in bed, in a bed? Did you share the bed with anybody? Um, what kind of clothes did you wear? Because through this, you get so much social and cultural history. And I was just, I told you I just finished teaching. And one of my students interviewed her mother, who's quite old, and also through her mother got her grandmother's stories that they were displaced people from Eastern Europe during um, the 40s. And her mother never real, her mother grew up mostly in the late 40s and 50s. 40s in the camp and then 50s here in, in Boston, actually. And she didn't know that they were poor because they, you know, her mother managed to feed a family. I mean, that that is cross-cultural. You have large families, you have no money. How do you feed everybody a healthy meal? One pot, what puss in it, things like that. Anyway, when this girl started going to school, she realized her clothes are very different. They still, because her mother made them, they still had that old country cut and the way the clothes were put together. And for the first time, she felt ashamed. She realized she was poor and she thought she was American now, but she wasn't American like her classmates were. I mean, these are heartbreaking stories, but we've all got them if we can access them. So... Our history is American history, and that's what I love. And I love when, um, 
you know, you talk about a historical event. Okay, I was of the generation that talked about when JFK was shot and we were sent home from school and we had older family members. They were sort of tangential family members, but I just said, oh my God, the world is, is ending. The president was shot and this older family member, the same guy who looted this mess of, of screws and bolts and nuts said, I remember when McKinley was shot and I said, but that was history, you know, I mean, um, it's the early 20th century, right? I mean, remembering things. And when I talk about, oh, I remember when JFK was shot, one of my sisters said, gosh, I wasn't even born then, you know, I mean, we are so much a product of our times and our culture. And, oh, again, I could go on and on because think <laughs> about, um, how, well, I, actually, I forgot the, the point I was going to make about that. Um, we're so much a part of our, our culture and our times. And we will be telling these stories. I, what I will leave you with is, you know, we've just been through Thanksgiving. And for many families, I know we couldn't necessarily have the, the feast that we wanted. Think about this pandemic is going to have a huge effect. We don't even know all the tentacles that are going out. And how are families going to share these stories? Are they doing it through Zoom? Are they going to create family websites? You know, I took, oh, I wanted to show you quickly um, some books that have come out. They're all in the Belmont Library. These are my cards. This is a woman, Caroline Preston, who used to live in Cambridge. She's a writer, but she did a family story. This is on a Ward Rides scrapbook, a woman who married a guy from Brattle Street in Cambridge and their life. Um, this one, she also wrote one on um, a friend who, her mother's friend who moved to Paris in the 1920s and knew all, you know, all of the people in Paris. This one called Belonging by Nora Krug, a German reckons with history and home. She is a German born woman. I think she's in her late 30s, maybe early 40s. She now lives in New York, but she wanted to know what her family's, um, what her family did during the Second World War in Germany. And she took her a long time. She finally found some family members to talk to, but she wrote this very, put together this very imaginative book with drawings. It's, you know, it's part scrapbook. It's part, um, photographs from her own family, from news accounts. So you can be as creative with this, or you can simply, if you're a writer, you know, you're sitting down and you're just saying, oh, so-and-so said this over the Thanksgiving table or the Christmas table, or this Christmas, I've got a list. And I always, I don't see my family that much in Maryland these days, but we talk on Zoom every Sunday. And I send lessons in advance, uh, questions in advance because they're my resource source, not just about family stuff, but about food traditions or how they changed. Um, there's this whole genre right now of some of my BU students who talk about the, 19, the food of the 1970s, which I don't think of as great food, but I remember it, you know, Kool-Aid and, tang and that processed cheese but they loved it because up until then their their mothers mostly mothers were doing meals from scratch and when they could go to the grocery store and get all this junk food it was just wonderful so they speak very fondly of that and you know they start talking and we go right back to that period so <laughs> This is powerful stuff. That's, we don't realize how powerful it is until we get into it and start talking. And you realize, you know, you want to go back and see your past, where you lived, where you went to school, or you don't want to touch it with a barge pole. Everybody responds differently to things. 
Thank you so much, Millie. This was really terrific. As you said, I'm sure we could just talk all night. Um, so you'll send me the titles of the books and I'll send I them out to everybody. I will, and I'll send you some websites. I'll try not to overwhelm you, but um, you know we've got a fabulous library and fabulous librarians in Belmont, but also in other communities, and um, they love these questions. You know, I'm looking for a book about such and such, or I'm trying to find out more about the Baltimore Fire, and where do I go? I've explored everything on my computer. So thank you, Amy, for putting this together and. Have a great holiday, everybody, and go forth and collect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good okay. night. Bye-bye.